I think it just fucking sounds cool. It's not even a matter of if it actually works. Huh? All right, so some things that I thought were really cool, bypassing the Mac solution. There's a lot of stuff out there on the web that can make your uh, Linux box actually support VLAN tagging and frame tagging. So uh, just download the right code uh, so that your Linux box can support frame tagging. And then one of the things that's really cool is some switches have auto provisioning of voice over IP devices. So if you can emulate a Cisco phone, or if you can emulate in a BIA phone, a lot of cases the switch will actually auto provision you and move you into the voice VLAN. So bypassing Mac solutions, this is great. If I could plug in and I could get myself moved automatically into the voice VLAN. Well, all the devices in the voice VLAN need to be able to talk to the call manager. People generally deploy the call manager in the DMZ with all of the other critical servers. And instead of just making an ACL that says everything in my voice <coughs> VLAN is only allowed to talk to my call manager, they let everything in the voice VLAN talk to everything in the server network. So generally it gets me right in. So they've got a Mac solution. I unplug a phone, plug my laptop in, jump on the voice VLAN, go straight after the server network. You know, too easy. Okay. So moving around the network and bypassing nips and hits. The first thing that you have to realize if you're dealing with IPSs, host-based and network-based in the LAN. We're not talking external, we're talking in the LAN now. We just talked external. In the LAN, the biggest thing that they're looking for is they're looking for ankle bodies. They're looking for the port scanners. They're looking for the backtrack boys. Okay, now if any of you guys are stuck in the backtrack tape, yeah, whatever, dude. So what I'm talking about is the scanner monkeys, people who fire up in map and scan the whole fucking planet, right? That's what IPSs are made for. So essentially what I do is instead of port scanning the whole network, I use net commands. Net commands work beautifully. Okay, it's the functional equivalent of browser network neighborhood, right? So you plug in, try over your net commands, figure out where all the machines are, figure out, now bear in mind, yes, I realize this only works for Windows-based machines and machines running Samba, but there's some stuff we can do for the Linux host as well. But figuring out who's in what domains and who's in what groups is usually the biggest component for me. And then mapping the network uh, via net commands really is how I do the bulk of my internal pen testing now. So when I'm in Metasploit, you'll constantly see me flipping back and forth. I use uh, Git system, escalate to system, do my thing, uh, disable hips or whatever it is I have to do, uh, hit rev to self, bounce back to a regular user, do my net commands, use pass the hash, jump from box to box, okay? escalate to system, do whatever I have to do, rev to self, back to a regular user, use my net commands, move from box to box. Okay, so that's really the kind of methodology that I'm taking when I'm in the land. So we have another couple of things. These are some little one-liners. So if you've got a local admin access on one box, um, there's a technique called token stealing. So what happens is you can log into a box, and if a domain admin has logged into this box before, and the box hasn't been rebooted, you can steal his token. So what these are, these are like four or five different little one-liners that you can use to figure out where these domain users are logged into. So what you can do is you can go do your net commands, figure out who these domain users are, and which people are in the admin groups and the help desk groups and the sysadmin groups and all that, and now I can use these commands to go sweep the network and figure out where those logged in users are. So I'm looking for these five or six usernames, I'll write these little one-liners, or I'll put them in like a little batch file or VBS script, and I'll go find out where those logged in users are, I'll use patch the hash, I'll log into that box, and then I'll escalate privileges and become domain admin. So it doesn't take long, guys. Okay, so this is moving around the network. This is the pass the hash technique I was talking about. You just throw a PS exec shell, and you can take your stolen password hash, and you can just log in with this. Okay, so I ran into um, McAfee Hips. Uh, so they had EPO, they had Hips. And uh, this thing was such a pain in the ass. So, how many of you guys been on a pen test? You you try to kill the antivirus and the hips, and it keeps respawning. You guys ever run into that? Okay, so trick that I figured out for that, right? Kill all the services, 
So like in this case, NetStop and McAfee Framework Service, now I've NetStop the HIPS, NetStop and their agent, NetStop IRPM. Trick number one, you need to escalate to system to do this. So you get on the box, even if you're admin, escalate to system first. Kill all the services off. Now you see these processes, PS kill these, UData, TV Mod, MC Shield, VS Task Manager, SH Stat, and now kill the fire tray. Getting all of that stuff generally stops it from responding. If you're still having it to where it keeps responding, I don't have the lineup here, but just you know, holler at me, I'll give you guys the syntax. You actually have to unhook the DLLs out of memory or yank the driver out of memory. But it's not that bad. I mean, I've only had a couple of cases where I've had to go to that extent. And that's just because they have it on like some sort of high enforcing mode where everything's running. Okay, so this is the Metasploit Git System trick. So I just say use priv, Git System, and it has a bunch of tricks, four ways that it tries to do Git System. So make sure that you escalate the system first. And then after that, my favorite part, I'm in the domain. Use incognito, impersonate the domain admin's token. And then I generally just do a quick, you know, Joe, Joe Rocks, little net user add slash domain, add myself to the domain admin's group. Go get myself a rum and coke. Tell the customer, do the domain admin. Deuces. Yep. So it's really not too hard. Defense. All right. I got like some little documents I've been writing. So I've got some little one and two page docs for each of these attacks. So if you want to know like how they work, they're not quite white paper, but you know it's like a little description kind of doc where it's the, the attack and the defense component. So if you're looking for something like that and you want that, holler at me. I'll give you guys my contact info. Here's my contact info. So if you want to holler at me, you want that kind of stuff, like, hey, dude, I want this so I can go show my boss our network sucks, or if you want to do the important thing, want to hire me to come give your network the beat down, holler at me. I, I, I enjoy traveling and you know, fucking up people's networks. So um, that's it. Does anybody have any questions for me? Cricket, cricket, cricket. What's up on the back? Yeah, um, just one thing on the kernel layer drivers that people use. Oh. Can you pass them off? Sure. Thank you. Uh, just one thing on the kernel layer drivers and uh, uh, getting those out. How do you deal with a system that if you stop running that in memory, it blue screens the system? Um, is, are there any ways around that that you see that you could use to kill off its antivirus and these respawning processes? Okay, so the question is when you're stopping the processes at blue screens or when you're yanking the DLL from memory at blue screens? When, when you stop the kernel process running, the whole box comes down, uh, you get a blue screen, and that's it. Okay, so he's saying when you stop the kernel process. Uh, generally, I don't stop the actual kernel process. I kill the processes related to the, uh, <coughs> the hips itself. So I don't stop the whole kernel unless I'm misunderstanding what you're saying. Are you um, just saying removing that DLL from memory causes it to blue screen? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, if, if, if the kernel decides that when it can't see its DLL or it can't see its process loaded, it thinks it's being attacked and it takes itself down. Okay. Uh, okay, so, all right, all right, all right. So, with semantic endpoint protection, I can't speak on McAfee for this, but if I'm not mistaken, it is set. With semantic endpoint protection, they actually have. Uh, command line executable that you can use when you have a corrupt install and you're trying to remove it and reinstall it. So I've got a little private script I can share, a uh, little interpreter upload script. Um, it's not public, but you know, fuck it. Find me a wrong code, I'll give it to you. So Thanks. essentially what that does is that particular script is from Symantec, I mean that executable is from Symantec, and that actually tries to fix a corrupt install by safely removing it. So what we do is we just write a little interpreter script that uploads that exe and calls that. So what I would say is, um, in either case, against Symantec or against McCaffrey, try to find the uninstall guides, and the uninstall guides is actually where I got that syntax to do all of that. So I just found the uninstall guides and how to remove it from the registry and how to unhook those drivers. So what you're looking for is a troubleshooting guide that shows you how to deal with a corrupt install. That was how I learned it. So that, would, that should tell you the order to remove those in, 
so that the machine should not lose strength. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you, Joe. Any other questions? Uh, it's time for the break because we're running a little bit late, so uh, let's just ho hook up with you in the lounge if there are any further questions. All right. So thank you, everybody, for. Uh,